Welcome to the Daily Update. This is being prepared Wednesday, June 15th, where we'll look at the action in the market today and then see how things look for Thursday, June 16th. And just a little note as I get started, there is a dog near where I'm recording that is voicing his or her opinion, and that might get picked up on the microphone. I also have a cat that is scratching on the door trying to get in. Just think of that as added features to today's video. Another thing I want to mention is I did have trouble uploading the video yesterday. I recorded it, but because of power outages and internet issues, I wasn't able to upload it until much later. And that can happen at any time. I'm trying to make the videos a little bit shorter and more to the point. But that doesn't always work because it sometimes takes a while to get to the point. I just need time to talk about things to give you a good picture of what's happening. Also, I'm going to try to keep these videos as much as take one as possible. That also will cut down the amount of time that I need to spend editing and I can get things uploaded. Because there's a lot of other things that I need to work on as part of my program and with recording and preparing the video taking so long each day that doesn't allow me to do some of the other things that I feel some of you could really benefit from. Another thing to be aware of is my YouTube channel. The numbers are really going up and down as far as the subscribers. I seem to be involved in one of these fake sub programs. I don't know what the reason for this is. What benefit does that do anybody? My Subscriber count really shot up, then it went down, then it went back up. Now it got taken down even more. The reason why I bring that up is I'm trying to get to 500 subscribers, at least consistently, so then I can make use of the community page. And that's where I can make announcements like, okay, I'm not going to be able to do a video today, or this is running late, or I could start posting some articles in there that you might find useful and different bits of information that I don't necessarily have to include in the video. And that might help keep the videos a little bit shorter. Okay, let's go back and talk about what happened. It was Fed Day on Wednesday. At the open, we did gap higher up to R1, which was at about 37.74. As the day went on, prices drifted until the FOMC announcement. And that's pretty normal, and I have a chart to show you that. After the announcement... Prices did gyrate around. They went down to the daily pivot at first at 37.40, but then were able to climb up to R2 at 38.12, and then even get above R2. Going into the close, we saw selling back down to R2, and we ended up being up 1.46%. It's kind of interesting, and you'll see this in the chart, that prices were just about at the same point by the end of the day, as where they were when the Fed made their announcement. So that can be more positive, I see, is that, yeah, the market reacted, but it didn't catch the market off guard. Volume was above average. We're starting to see a pickup in volume, and that, that could be helpful as far as helping us make decisions. The technicals we're still looking at are quite negative. The big fixation is inflation and interest rates which produces growth concerns. There might be some kind of a hangover on Thursday with the FOMC meeting. All of the geopolitical concerns and then earnings as well. What are some comments? This was probably an oversold bounce and we saw that both for stocks and bonds. There were also a lot of revisions made to some economic projections such as the PCE inflation and that's what the Fed really uses to measure inflation. It was raised to 5.2 where it had been at 4.3 core CPE inflation that's part of the PCE component it was also raised to 4.3 from 4.1 real GDP was lowered and I have a chart it had been at 2.8 and it was lowered to 1.7 the unemployment rate they bumped that up in their projections to 3.7 and then the Fed funds rate where they had had it at 1.9 now they're projecting it to be 3.4. And then the scenario that I posted yesterday, this is still kind of what we're working with. And you'll hear different variations, and this may change from day to day. The only thing that is concrete now is the part in green. They raised interest rates three quarters of a percent on Wednesday. 
The other ones are still up in the air. Because remember, this scenario didn't change all that long ago. We were looking at a 50 basis point move up. But with the CPI that came out, that bumped everything up to 75. They're also right now looking at a 75 basis point move in July. But during the press conference, Chairman Powell said maybe 50. So that can change all the time. And then the other part of the scenario is the 50 basis point move in September. So that it, by the end of the meeting in September, the Fed funds will be at two and three quarters to 3%. And that's the range that it will go through. Fear is really extreme right now. There are real recession concerns going forward. And then in Europe, the European Central Bank, they held an emergency meeting to try to come up with a plan to stop falling bond prices. Because not only are bond prices falling in the U.S., but they're also falling in Europe. And that's really bumping up interest rates. As far as the economic reports that were released, as far as the applications index for mortgages, it increased 6.6% on a week-over-week -week basis. The big one was retail sales, and it decreased 0.3%, where they expected it to be up 0.2%. The New York Fed's Empire State Manufacturing Survey, it was minus 1.3, where they expected it to be at 3. The reason I bring this up is anytime we get a reading under zero, that shows contraction. If it's above zero, that means the economy in that area is expanding. The import-export price index showed that there was a three-tenths of a percent decline on non-fuel imports, and that means 5.9% on a year-over-year -year basis, and a 2.9% increase in non-agricultural exports. On an annual basis, that's 9.3%. So we're just seeing a decline in imports and an increase in exports. Business inventories increased 1.2%, and that was as expected. The NAHB Housing Market Index fell to 67. They expected it to be at 68, and it was at 69 last time we had this report. Our trend is negative. I've switched the bias over to mix because we're very oversold still. We had a positive day, but we're still in a very negative environment. So the momentum is still negative. Let's go back and talk about the day session. We are showing extreme negative sentiment right now as far as fear. So we've dropped below 25. This is something that I found from Isabel Net, put out by Bank of America. And what is freaking people out the most? It's the fear of hawkish central banks. That is growing as the war fears seem to drop off. You don't seem to be hearing as much about the Russia-Ukraine war in the news. Doesn't mean it's still not happening. Doesn't mean it couldn't come back. In our age of media where we have very short attention spans, one thing falls away as another thing is being replaced. Most people are just freaked out about what the Fed's doing. It's also really increasing about a recession and inflation and something about a systematic credit event. And the Russia-Ukraine conflict is dropping off. Fewer people are talking about COVID-19 and some people are talking about cryptos, but not very many. The VIX declined with the up day, both on a closing basis, and we came down and kind of filled in this gap. And the VIX of the VIX also declined, both on the bar chart and on a closing basis. Fear continues to go up, according to the ulcer index. We're down 20.99%. The equity put call ratio on a five-period basis, it's still going up overall and showing pretty extreme fear. What I wanted to show was a chart here. It's price to earnings ratio at prior bear market bottoms. What was the PE ratio at that time? And they're using the trailing 12 months to do this. That's TTM. And it just shows you how things worked over a period of time. The average is 11.7. So what is the PE ratio right now? We're at 19.5. So this could mean that the market is still overvalued from a historical perspective, but it doesn't necessarily mean this is gonna change quickly. Once these numbers get out of line, it can take a long time for them to, to adjust. And this chart goes back all the way to the 1870s. So we've got a good amount of data on this chart. Another thing that was revised is the GDP now. It had been slightly positive. I put this arrow in the zero here, 
because that's what they're projecting right now. They're not saying the GDP is going to be positive or negative. They're just saying it's going to be zero. Looking at some earnings issues, this is the 12-month forward EPS growth. And notice how it's been coming down. And then the Fed funds rate, which is now going up. So we're seeing a correlation between the two. When the Fed funds rate goes up, the earnings go down. Interest rates up, earnings down. We're starting to see that kind of an environment again. So that could be more negative for the S&P. Looking at support and resistance, and I have no idea if this is actually helping you. The first chart that I'm bringing up is the intraday pivot levels. And these change every day. And if you look in an intraday chart, maybe that will help you. And there's a lot of different types of support and resistance levels on this chart. Then I go and I look at the daily chart more with what I've come up with for different support levels. And we're still down below S1. And we have S2 down below us at 35.86. See, support and resistance, it might look good in hindsight, but it's also very subjective at the time because... You could have a bunch of different people come up with different support and resistance levels. So that's why I'm putting a lot of lines on the chart and why it's really hard for me to give direct answers. So I just look at what's worked before, realizing that that could change at any time. Here's on the daily chart. These stay the same for the whole month. So these levels don't change. What does change is the daily bar. Here's a little easier one to read where we're going back and testing the low set in 2021. And as of right now, we could be bouncing up off of that. Another one is showing that we're still below these two FIB levels that are overlapping each other from the COVID low to the high. And then another low that we set back in 2020 to the high. And now that we've fallen below this, if we start to bounce up, this will probably provide resistance now. Then on the weekly chart, we're trying to come back up to this very much longer term Fibonacci retracement. That could also act as resistance as we try to go above that. Looking at the Fed, and then after this video, it'll probably drop off for a while. There's now a 77.8% chance that they're going to raise rates to two and a quarter to three, okay? Well, we're at one and a half now, so that would be another 75 basis point move. And this will change as economic reports come out, as things go up and down, but this is how it looks right now. And then in September, they're looking at being at two and three quarters to three and a half, my goodness, by the end of that meeting. Looking at the... Two-year yield compared to the Fed funds rate. This is an updated chart from Edward Yardeni. The Fed has now raised interest rates. The futures show that we could still be going higher, but the blue line, which is the actual yield that we follow on the price charts, it came down a little bit, and so we're starting to fill this gap slightly. What we want to see is this come back more in line and get closer together with what's really happening. Looking at the sectors, see nine out of the 11 were negative with discretionary doing the best in real estate. The two that were down were materials and energy. And here it just shows how things have performed since the all-time high. It's kind of the same chart we've been seeing. Energy is the only sector that remains positive. Our technical alerts, we had a BPI cross below 20. And I'll show you that on a chart. That's negative for the S&P. But the S&P was able to get back above 3,800. Kind of a mixed bag with this one. Intraday, in the overnight session. And I start this with the new day. So this started on June 15th. And we were pretty positive with the futures. And then right in about this area is when the market opens. Here's the daily chart showing how we gapped up right here to R1. Bounced up a little bit, came down, bounced up. And this is more common for before there's going to be a Fed announcement. The announcement came out, we gyrated around. First, we shot down below the pivot. Then we went all the way up to R2 and then came back down. And we ended up being just at about the same level that we were at before the announcement was made. 
Here's a one minute chart just showing how things were going up and down, up and down. The Fed makes their announcement. We start to gyrate. There's a real increase in volume. At first, we went lower. Then the press conference started and things started to improve where it doesn't go straight up or straight down. And then we did see some selling coming into the close. Technical overview, nothing has changed here. It's just a broken record for right now. So I just go through this quickly. Stocks, bonds, sectors, indexes, cryptos, they are all still negative overall. Our trend is still negative. We're seeing an advancing ADX, even though the red line came down on the up day, we did see the green line turn up. But since the red line is on top, that's what we default to. So we are in a negative trend. As far as breadth, seeing a little bit of a bounce based on price and volume. Our advanced decline ratio, a little bit of a bounce. New highs, new lows haven't really turned up yet. So we're still negative there. Little bit of a turn up with the accumulation distribution, but still below the moving average. Stocks below their 50 period moving average. This is still extreme negative and suggests that we might still be oversold. On a 200 period moving average, we could still drop below this and come down here into this other area. That would produce a longer term climactic signal. Short term charts, the rate of change looking back five periods is trying to bounce up. The force index also saw a bit of a bounce looking back 10 periods with the rate of change, a bounce, a little bit of a bounce based on price and volume with the Swenland trading oscillator, McClellan oscillator also bounced. So we saw some bouncing out of our short term indicators, the Stoke RSI as the Williams percent R. So we're seeing across the board bouncing short term as with our moving average study, stochastics. Now, looking at our intermediate term charts, we're still far away when we measure standard deviation. That just means price needs to get back in line with what the mean price has been over a period of time. The Sean trend meter continues to be negative. The CCI 14, it's still extreme negative, as is the CCI 20. The chicken oscillator is trying to turn up, but is still negative. Chicken money flow finally turned negative. Ease of movement was pretty much flat. Volume has been picking up lately. The vortex is still negative overall. Summation index based on price and volume are still negative. Our oscillators are negative with the short term ones and the intermediate term ones and rolling over with the longer term. Here's the fall below 30 that was picked up as an alert with the BPI. The PMOs that are rising, still extreme negative, bouncing up a little. The buy signals, still negative. And those that are above zero, also negative. TTM squeeze is also switched over to a more definite negative reading. I don't have any chart variations because there's no change. And I'm trying to not include charts that don't change. We are negative with the elders on the S&P as well as the SPY. The SAR is still negative as well. And our go no go system is still deep purple. Man, those guys were good. Long term, seeing a bit of a bounce with the 50, 150 and 200. Special K starting to show more of a decline. The broad market, we are still negative with the Dow but neutral with the Qs. The dollar declined a little bit, but took out this previous high. And there's still a really strong inverse relationship between the S&P and the dollar. So if the dollar is going up right now, the S&P is probably going down and vice versa. Oil did decline a little over 3%, but we're still at 115.31. Looking at bonds, we're seeing a real strong correlation between yields going up and the S&P going down. But what happened on Wednesday is yields came down and the S&P went up. So it still maintained that strong inverse relationship. The tech sector to the 10 year correlation. Interest rates fell. Tech bounced a little bit. So they still have a really strong inverse relationship. Treasury yields really rolled over.
on all different maturity levels. Positive possible scenarios. Most of these are off the table. We're watching a new spike in the two-year treasury yield. Until that looks to come down significantly, that's not a viable option right now. And we're seeing a real strong correlation between the S&P and the two-year yield. The staples were up a little bit, so we're kind of keeping an eye on this. This might be putting in another spike, but we want to see more follow-through with price. So what's our outlook? The technicals are negative and oversold still. Sentiment is pretty extreme. We have housing starts and building permits coming out. Jobless claims, which we get every week, and the Philadelphia Fed index. Then the different geopolitical events, Russia, Ukraine, China, and supply chain issues. The big one, inflation and interest rates, which produces growth concerns. If we start to fall, there might be more worries about margin calls. Oil, of course, is so extreme. Earnings, any more Fed speak that we might hear of, and then the longer term situation in Japan. So what are our scenarios? We're still down overall because of all the things that I had just said. And there may be some follow through Fed reaction, which could be positive or negative. So I include that in the second scenario. The technicals are negative, but still oversold, but showing a little bit of a bounce in the short term. And that could help things go up a little bit from here. Just a disbelief that the market can't go any higher or maybe a continued favorable reaction to what the Fed did on Wednesday. The only scenario that looks somewhat viable now is the staple spike. On a positive level, our technicals are really still negative. So we're looking at different pivot points. We're trying to get back to some short-term moving averages, looking at FIB retracements or previous levels, which could provide either support or resistance. And we're not neutral now because the ADX is above 20 and it is negative. So our conclusion is the S&P is negative, short term negative, and continues to be oversold, but showing a little bit of a bounce. Intermediate term also negative and oversold. Long term, we're still negative. So thank you. I hope this was helpful to you. I'll just talk here for a minute to try to add some extra time to the video so that the end cards don't overlap what I'm trying to say.